So um, I've been coming here uh, every fourth Sunday of the month, and um, a few months ago I started a series of sermons. Uh, so I've been continuing in that same series. And so this is the fourth sermon in that series. And that series is called Mess Worth Making. It's a series about community relationships and relational conflicts. Uh, and today's sermon is entitled, How to Handle Disagreements, okay? We all have disagreements. This is, a, this is a practical sermon on how do we deal with disagreements. Last time that I came, we talked a lot about speaking the truth with love and gentleness. Because we said that we're called to talk to him or her one-on-one -on -one with truth and love. And we're not called to fight or to take flight, but to engage in a gentle conversation of love and respect, focusing on the purpose of the conversation rather than let, get it, letting the thing bog us down. So that's what we talked about a month ago, but what if you and that person disagree? What if the conversation leads to a standoff? What do you do? Disagreements happen all the time, right? I mean, we disagree if we have relationship with people, we, we disagree about how to spend money, disagree about cultural issues, disagree about what's right and wrong, disagree about sex, disagree about kids if you're married. We disagree even how to disagree, you know? Um, do you know when my wife Grace and I had our first argument as a married couple? You know when? During our honeymoon. That's right, during our honeymoon. Do you know what we argued about? You know what we argued about? We argued about arguing. I, I don't really remember what we argued about. I, I don't remember, but all I remember was that I wanted to resolve the argument really quickly, right? You know, so I go, we gotta talk about it, we gotta talk about it, we gotta resolve this issue. Did the Bible say, don't let the sun go down on anger? So we gotta talk about it. And she's all like, we're not gonna talk about it. And she just walked away. I go, what are you doing? You can't walk away. We're like a married couple now. I mean, we are a married couple. We gotta argue and, and, and like resolve the issue right now. So like, I don't wanna talk to you. So we argued about arguing. Point is not who we're right in that argument. I, I just remember we, we, we argued about arguing. You know, even the church has been arguing so much that they have they have split over every conceivable issue and even some inconceivable issues. In the 11th century, the Catholics excommunicated the Eastern Orthodox and then the Eastern Orthodox in return excommunicated the Catholics. So, and they're still split, you know, the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church are still split. In the time of the Reformation, there was a division between the Catholics and the Protestants. And then in the 19th century, that was the start of the denominations. By the end of 19th century, at the beginning of 19th century, how many denominations are there? Like one, you know, like Protestants, that's it. You know, we had 2,000 denominations. In the, among the Protestants. And by the end of the 20th century, we had 34,000 denominations around the world. The basic and sad fact is that the church has disagreed among itself and split over every issue you can possibly imagine. You know, and this tragedy is summed up in a story I heard uh, from Nicky Gumbo in the Alpha Course. Uh, something that I had, something that happened at the Golden Gate Bridge. This man said, I was standing in the middle of the Golden Gate Bridge, admiring the view when another tourist walked up alongside of me to do the same. I heard him say quietly as he tucked in the beauty of the view, what an awesome God. I turned to him and said, are you a Christian? He says, yes, I am a Christian. I said, so am I, and we shook hands. 
I said, are you a liberal or a fundamental Christian? He said, I'm a fundamental Christian. I said, so am I. And we smiled and nodded to each other. I said, are you a covenant or dispensational fundamental Christian? He said, I'm a dispensational fundamental Christian. I said, so am I. And we slapped one another on the back. I said, are you an early acts, mid acts, or late acts dispensational fundamental Christian? He said, I'm a mid acts dispensational fundamental Christian. I said, so am I. And we agreed to exchange Christmas cards each year. I said, are you an acts 9 or 13 mid acts dispensational fundamental Christian? I said, I'm an acts 9 mid acts dispensational fundamental Christian. And I say, so am I. And we hugged one another right there on the bridge. And I say, are you a pre-trib or post-trib mid-acts 9, mid-acts dispensational fundamental Christian? He said, I'm a pre-trib, acts 9, mid-acts dispensational fundamental Christian. I said, so am I, and we agreed to exchange our kids for the summer. I said, are you a 12-in or 12-out pre-trib, acts 9, mid-acts dispensational fundamental Christian? He said, I'm a 12-in pre-trip, Acts 9, mid-Acts dispensational fundamental Christian. And I said, you heretic! And I pushed him off the bridge. <laughs> anyway, I hope that was worth the time for the joke. But uh, what... When we disagree, our natural tendency is to fight or split. I mean, we reject people we disagree with, we, we distance ourselves from them, we condemn them, and we judge them. And we think about it, how can we not? We're right and they're wrong, right? And if they got control of the world, if they want the argument, the world will go down the drain, you're thinking, right? You can't have them get their way. The classic is the slippery slope argument. If that happens, then all hell's gonna break loose. There's no balancing. There's no compromising in a discussion. There's no nuancing. There's no reasoning. You just reject them and judge them. That's that's our tendency oftentimes. But the question is, is there a better way? How can we better handle disagreements? So let's go to the Bible. Let's go to Romans chapter 14. It's printed in your bulletin, all right? Romans chapter 14. If you're cold, you can jump around as you listen to me. Stand up and jump around. And cool, you know, warms you up a little bit. And there's also cough. There used to be coffee over there. Okay, let me give you a little introduction to this passage so you can better understand the context of the passage. So Apostle Paul is writing the church in Rome, and, and you have to remember that there were Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles are non-Jews, okay? Worshipping together in the Roman church. Jews grew up kosher, and they keep the Sabbath. Right? You know some Jewish people, right? A lot of them are kosher and they still keep the Sabbath. And this was like that 2,000 years ago as well. It was a critical part of their religious identity. And they still are. The laws of the Old Testament commanded them to do this. And, 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 and they couldn't just stop being kosher or stop celebrating these religious holidays. So they couldn't buy meat that was kosher in the market. So many Jews became vegetarians because when they went to Gentile market they're not kosher and so the meat was not kosher so they just couldn't eat any meat if they went to a Gentile's household and they served meat they couldn't eat any of the meat because they weren't kosher they weren't prepared the right way the church had decided in the council of Jerusalem this is in the book of Acts if you want to look it up and in a meeting of all of the apostles of Jesus Christ that the Gentiles are not subject to these Old Testament laws. They don't have to be kosher and they don't have to follow these laws. That's why we, we Christians, Gentile, most of us are Gentile, Gentiles, we're not kosher. Because in the Council of Jerusalem they said that we don't have to be kosher. Even though the Old Testament law says that we have to be kosher. Now, 
the, 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 the disagreement was, was, was not that simple for them. Uh, you know, so in, in the council, before the Council of Jerusalem, they, they, the Holy Spirit spoke to Peter about this very closely, you know? And, and there was this huge dispute in a church early on about this issue. Paul's letter to Galatians, if you read that, shows the magnitude of the debate. Paul uncompromisingly and absolutely believed that Christians, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, are not subject to these laws. That's what he believed. If you look at the book of Galatians, it's very, very clear that that's what he believed. He believed that we are free from these laws. Okay, that's his opinion. Yet, this is how he addresses the church in Rome regarding this issue. The disagreement they had about this particular issue. Okay? This is what he said. Romans chapter 14. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master's servant stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Verse 5. One person considers one day more sacred, sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord. For they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us live for ourselves alone. And none of us die for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Amen. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both death, dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God, so that each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Verse 13. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. See, Paul actually has an opinion. He says, I'm convinced that it's okay. You, can, you don't have to be kosher, he said. But... If anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your acting do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. This is the word of God. Amen? This passage is, is brilliant. This is brilliant. It's so nuanced. This, this passage teaches us how to handle disagreements. Okay? First, this passage teaches us not to condemn or judge people you disagree with because God is bigger and broader 
than each of us. Yes. Amen? He says in verse 3 to 4, he says, The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. God accepts them both, he says. God is able to make them stand, even though he absolutely believes that all food is clean and we don't have to abide by these Old Testament laws. He is saying that God is bigger and broader than we think. That's a pretty amazing perspective. See, because what do we do? We often make God think exactly the way we do, right? Christians are like worse sinners regarding this. We have, we, 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 we have our own way of looking at the Bible. We, we look at it. We grew up in a certain tradition. And if anybody disagrees with you, you think that they disagree with God. But Paul is saying God is bigger and broader and more encompassing than our own opinions on matters. We could be right and someone else could be wrong, but God accepts them both. God accepts us both. We could be, I could be right, you could be wrong. You're totally wrong. And we can argue and argue as if you know, the rightness is the issue, but Paul is saying rightness is not the issue because you know what? God accepts us both. God accepts us both. Next time you get in an argument, just pull back and look and say, you know, God accepts us both. God accepts us both. You know why God accepts us both? The gospel of Jesus Christ, which is at the heart of what we believe, says God's acceptance of us is based on His grace and not based on our works or even our rightness. God doesn't go, oh, you're right, so you're accepted. You're wrong, you're not accepted. That's not how God's work. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. We could actually be wrong. We could actually have wrong theology. We, we can get things wrong. Yet God accepts us. He makes us stand. That is the heart of the gospel. You know, the doctrine, although it is critical, it is very important, but at the heart of everything is God's grace and mercy. With that, is why we're accepted. His love and grace and mercy. And not necessarily our likeness. When we start to look at it from God's perspective, sometimes disagreements get put into their proper perspective. Sometimes we get frustrated with people who have different theological opinions and there might be people who have different opinions about the role of women in the church. There might be people who have different opinion about, you know, gifts of the Holy Spirit. There may be people who have different views about salvation and whether you have to say a certain formula of prayer or whether you have to be baptized in a particular way. Or But God accepts us all. He doesn't go, oh, do you have the right theology of baptism? Hey, did your dunking go all the way in? Did you say the right formula before you were dunked? Oh, you were sprinkled. You're going to hell. It's not God. That's not how he works. All Presbyterians, you know, you better watch out because you're sprinkled. <laughs> anyway, that's not God. We need humility in knowing that so much of what we argue about are not heaven or hell issues. They're not. It's not he's not saying, Apostle Paul is saying, he's not saying, oh yeah, you're right, I'm right, everybody's right, because you know what, who knows what's right. That's not his argument. He says, I know I'm right. I know I'm right, and I know you're wrong. But God accepts us both. 
That is a fascinating argument. That is a fascinating argument. Next time you have an argument with someone, think about that, okay? That's gonna take you away from that argument and the intensity of that argument as you pull back and say, God accepts us both. And so that's why we need to learn how to nuance the issue. We have to know how to layer the issue. We have to know what the important issues are and less important issues. We, we have to, uh, you know, we have a tendency to make everything into a black and white issue. You know, you're right or wrong. But you know, oftentimes there's like, there are the key issues of faith, which is that you're more screwed up than you think we are, you are, but God loves you more than you can ever imagine in Jesus Christ through the cross. And that's the issue. The fact that we are sinners saved by God's grace is something that we hold on to the, to the heart of the matter. Everything else probably things that we can dispute about even if they are right and wrong and God accepts us all and so that's the first reason God we should not judge because God is bigger and God accepts us all second reason is this this passage tells us not to judge or condemn people because sometimes there are more than one answer sometimes not always sometimes Verse 5, it says, one person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. So there were some people saying, hey, Sabbath, you got to keep the Sabbath. Sundown from Friday to sundown on Saturday. That is the Sabbath. The, the Lord said in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt keep the Sabbath holy. But early Christians... The Gentiles especially go, what Sabbath? What are you talking about? I never kept the Sabbath. I thought church was on Sunday. What's the Sabbath? And you know what? Hey, maybe Sunday is not the day. Maybe we, we should meet on Tuesday. We should, we should worship God every day of the week. Some people started to say, and other people say, no, you got to keep the Sabbath holy. And he said, no, every day. Sabbath holy, every day. And they're getting in a fight. They're getting an argument in the church about this. They're splitting in the church about this. They were pointing fingers at each other about this issue. You know what? They still do this on the same issue. Christians still fight about this issue. You know what? What's Apostle Paul's perspective on this issue? He says some people think this way. Some people think this way, right? He says some, one person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. That's what he says. That, that, that's, I'm just reading the Bible, man. That's what he said. The important thing is, I, he is calling us to broaden our mind to the possibility that we can both be right. It's not a matter of what position we hold. It's more of whether that position comes from our relationship with God. If people want to follow God, but they have different opinions on the how, let there be room for disagreement. People want to follow God, they sincerely want to follow God, but there are some disagreements on how to follow God. Let there be room for disagreement. The important thing is that whether we live or die, we do it for the Lord. That's what Paul says. We will be held accountable for God. So Paul says in verse 13, therefore let us stop passing judgment on one another. You know, we have lots of disagreements. Some people disagree about use of alcohol, proper use of alcohol. Some people think that drinking in moderation is okay. Some people think the answer is no. But the thing is, it's not about you go to the Bible and go, is it okay or not okay? In your relationship with God, is drinking a good thing? For many of you, the answer is very clear. It, it's not, it's, it, the answer in context of your relationship with God, it's very, very clear. And so you said, no, no drinking, man. That's slippery slope. You don't go there. But you know what? That's not the universal rule. There are other people who drinking is okay. But there are different ways that people follow Jesus Christ. You can't apply your reasoning 
to everybody. Everyone has to make their own determination. But you cannot kid yourself either. Like, oh yeah, it says moderation is okay, so that means it's okay for me. You can't kid yourself if you know yourself in the context of your relationship with God. What is the best thing for you? You know, people have disagreements about smoking, smoking cigarettes, smoking cigars. You have to make a determination on your own based on your relationship with God. Whether we live or die, we do it for the Lord. Whatever we're doing, we do it for the Lord. That's the important thing. It's not the actual content of this is how I'm going to do it. So everybody's got to do it this way. This is how I became a Christian. This is how I grew as a Christian. So everybody he has got to do it that way, this way, or you are, you're, you're wrong, you're on your way to hell. That's, that's not. You may provide some wisdom to some people, but that is not the universal truth that you can apply to everyone. The universal truth is that we are sinners living in God's grace, and as we have our relationship with God, we determine on our own. In light of the scriptures, in light of the teachings of the scriptures, okay? Some things that are very clear in scripture, some things that are very not, uh, is not clear on scripture. And oftentimes, on the essentials there's unity, on the non-essentials there's diversity in the scripture. And we must understand that there's some diversity in opinion, and that's okay. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. And third, this passage tells us that blank is more important than being right. What is that word? What's more important than being right? Love. That's right. This passage teaches us that love is more important than being right. And you're thinking, you're wrong! <laughs> no. Love is more important than being right. Look, look, at this. look at verse 15. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, because you believe that is right, right? You are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. And then in verse 20 it says this, Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. This is a... You guys have to just meditate on this. I, I have to just meditate on this because stuff, this stuff is absolutely mind-blowing. He is saying that it's not about who is right or wrong. There is something that is greater at issue than the issue at disagreement. It is how you can help your brother and sister grow closer to God. You are not to exercise your freedom and your rights if it creates a stumbling block for them. Let me put it this way. For Paul, the freedom we have in Christ Jesus is huge. I mean, this guy, this guy grew up as a Pharisee. So when he came to realize that the gospel frees us from the requirements of the law, he was excited. This was a pivotal point in his life. This was huge. This became the heart of what he taught. We are not saved by the law. He constantly repeated himself. We are we're not saved by keeping the requirements of the law, but by grace through what Jesus has done for us. This was at the heart of the teaching of Paul. So to him, it was very obvious that even as a Christians, we are not called to go back to the law, but others weren't as sure as Paul was. Yet, he was more concerned about their spiritual growth, their spiritual health, than his own freedom. He was willing to enslave himself for the benefit of others. He did not want to create any stumbling blocks in the lives of other people. So when he was with Jews, guess what? He was kosher. But when he was with Gentiles, he didn't allow the law to get in the way of his fellowship with them. 
So he went, when he went back to Jerusalem later, later on in his life, he even went through a purification riot, riot, uh, rite and shaved his head according to the law of Moses. You see that in the book of Acts. Brothers and sisters, here's the point that I'm trying to make. It's not about whether we're right in a disagreement. It's not about winning the argument. It's about love. What are we doing to love and seek the benefit of the person that we disagree with? Love is, I'm not just talking about this warm, fuzzy feeling we have towards another person. I'm saying love in a sense of seeking the benefit of the other person over yours. Even though you have the right to do something. Even though you have the freedom not to do something. You are willing to forsake it for the benefit of others. That's what love is. He was willing to enslave himself for the benefit of others. Are we willing to sacrifice even our rights, even our freedom for the sake of person, for the sake of the person that we disagree with? Is you being right going to be a stumbling block to the person you disagree with? You know, um, I used to, I, I used to smoke cigarettes uh, for a long time. I started in college and got real bad in law school and continued on until about 14 years ago when my wife Grace got pregnant with Caitlin. Caitlin is right here. She's 13 now. She gave me permission to, to tell this story. I somehow stopped smoking. Um, I couldn't for the longest time, but somehow I stopped smoking. And um, my kids know this story, and, and they know that I stopped smoking partly for them. Because, you know, they're going to be born, so I, 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 I quit. Well, last year I went on a trip, a pilgrimage to Israel with a cohort of pastors, about 20 of us to Israel. Great trip, great pastors. After dinner, uh, this group of pastors would have what they call a holy smoke. They smoke cigar. They got into a little circle and they smoke cigar overlooking the Sea of Galilee. It, it was a great time of fellowship, you know, we, um, you know, they talked about church, they talked about loving the Lord, they talked about theological issues while puffing away on cigar. And so I picked up smoking cigar at, in Israel with a bunch of pastors. And, um, and after I came back from the trip, you know, I, I would pick up uh, and smoke cigar from time to time. You know, and sometimes I would smoke cigar with some people in the church, and uh, then I got used to it, and I started to enjoy it uh, a little more. So I would smoke cigar after the kids went to bed, and, um, and I told myself it helped me to relax. My wife Grace uh, didn't like that I was smoking cigar, but she tolerated it. But you know, cigars are expensive, so. I decided to order them in bulk online. So, um, you know, when you, and, and then when you get a bunch of cigars, you have to store them. So I decided to order a huge humidor to store the cigar. And, uh, and my kids found out from Amazon that I ordered a humidor and they found the humidor. They got so upset at me. Uh, my uh, younger, I have ten, uh, a 10 year old twins and um, uh, the girl twin, Eliana, cried and, and she felt that I had relapsed back into smoking. And, uh, and Caitlin, who's here, she was vehemently opposed to any form of smoking. And Bennett, my, my twin boy, uh, 
Ben, ben was so upset. He would take, uh, he would, he would, he would just try to force me to stop smoking cigar. And and I remember Grace was on the sideline, just really just enjoyed the scene. Um, and I try to convince the convinced my kids that cigars and cigarettes are not the same you know I told them I didn't inhale you know the smoke when you smoke cigars so it wasn't as bad as cigarettes but I sort of felt like Bill Clinton I didn't inhale you know and they, they all cornered me and told me that I had to quit smoking cigar and, um, and, I, and then when they cornered me um, I didn't want to promise them that I was uh, uh, I was gonna just do it and then somehow break my promise because I didn't make the promise voluntarily I, I was forced to do it so I asked them to give me 10 days to think about it and pray about it and so they agreed to give me 10 days as long as I didn't smoke during those 10 days so the, you know the tough crowd right so um, I try to find some research showing that occasional smoking of cigar is not really bad for you. But you know what? Uh, I couldn't find any medical support for this. I, I, I would Google it and look for it. I, I couldn't, it, and, and, and Grace kept on saying, don't look at me. She says, if you can find conclusive medical evidence that smoking cigar is not bad for you, then I'll stand up to the kids and say, let dad smoke some cigar from time to time. That's what she said. But, but, but you know, I just could not find anything and and so but then at the same time i was somewhat annoyed at my kids because i thought i felt like they're trying to take away my freedom i have the right to smoke cigar i'm their father i don't have to abide by what they're telling me that's what i was feeling at the time then i saw that caitlin was truly affected by the knowledge that i smoked cigar it, it was it was becoming a huge stumbling block for her, spiritual growth. You know, she and I often do um, go out on Thursdays and do Bible study together, and at that time, she didn't even want to do that anymore. She was just so disappointed in me. And that's when I realized that, you know, it's not about my rights. It's not really about my freedom. And you know what? It's not that good for me. <laughs> and the exercise of my freedom became a stumbling block to my kids' spiritual growth. So the Rowan 14 principle applied to this exact situation. The gospel of the cross is how, about how Jesus gave up his rights, how Jesus gave up his freedom, his relationship, so he can be a bridge to our relationship with God. And the gospel, it's not about winning the argument. It's not about being right. It's not about our rights. It's about love. It's about helping others. It's about seeking the good of others. Amen? Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father.